Your gun? <laughs> so he can tag his ear and study his mating habits. <laughs> Film at 11. Whew. Is it cool enough in here today? It has been... You with people around the... Re freezing? You're from Buffalo. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I hope you have a better year than you had last year. You're not going back. <laughs> Certain parts of the country will not believe it, and we should not dwell on it out here too much, but the weather here is uh, a little weird for this time of year. It was 92 here in Los Angeles today, and in certain parts of the country, it's below freezing. Uh, and here we come with another typical California Christmas. It's weird getting used to it. That's where all the, uh, the children get together and sing Christmas carols and dance around Frosty the Puddle. <laughs> Weird. It's, 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 uh, what happened? Frosty died. It's, uh... You don't start. We're going to start this again this year because Ed and I have had a thing going for years. He does not go shopping until Christmas Day, is what he well, says. The Eve. The Eve, Christmas Eve. Because obviously you get better bargains in or something. No, I don't no. know. What? Stores are relatively empty. It's easy to and find. The shelves are relatively empty, too. <laughs> have you been in Beverly Hills? On Rodeo Drive? Yes. Have you seen that in the magazines? That's the new elegant... I guess it rivals uh, Fifth Avenue in New York City now. It's one of the most expensive shopping centers in the entire... It's very exclusive up there. I want to tell you it is exclusive. How, um... <laughs> You're getting it. You're getting it. I want to tell you, it's so exclusive up there. If you want to pay cash, you have to show me your driver's license. <laughs> And if you don't drive up in a Rolls Royce, they give you a bath and a hot meal. It's very exclusive up there. By the way, the post office has asked me to announce, don't, please don't mail your packages early this year or they're going to get mixed up with last year's packages. <laughs> well, now, okay. I know what will happen tomorrow. We will get a phone call here at NBC from the post office saying you're just joking, weren't you? No. Okay, let's get it out of the way right now. We're joking. Mail your packages. What happened back in Washington today? Oh, the White House announced that President Carter is going to hold another press conference tomorrow. And we'll see what happens when the president says he can hold a press conference. All the major networks have to make time for that press conference. Do you realize that President Carter has held more press conferences since he has been in office about a year ago than any other president in history? Apparently, Mr. Carter wants the public to be the first to know in case anything happens while he's in office. <laughs> uh, the president's having a few problems. He can't get any of his programs past Congress. He likes to take his case right to the people, see, via television. Carter knows that this is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. He just can't get anybody to tell Congress that. That was kind of a historical joke, a documentary joke. <laughs> I was, I was kind of break the rhythm between the biggies, you see, and just give you a, a little rest period there. Rest time is over. <laughs> Gerald Ford is back in the news. Yeah, Gerald, he, he addressed a business group down in Palm Springs, California, and uh, Gerald Ford told these businessmen that we should have a tax cut to stimulate the economy. Now, I have a feeling, but when somebody starts talking that way, he is, he's planning to run for presidency again, wouldn't you guess, in the next election? Oh, yeah. They're little things. For example, Ford visited the Indian Reservation down in Palm Springs and promised the Indians a pardon for what they did to Custer. Uh, that's, that's a political, political move. Our own governor, Governor Jerry Brown, was in the news today. He's off to England. He's going to have some business meetings over there and meet Prince Charles, who was over here a few months ago. And our government, governor out here, Jerry Brown, is frugal. Let's be uh, honest. Oh. He's cheap. He's cheap. Uh, did you know he, is, he bought his own ticket and his flying economy? He, that's true. He went down. $140 ticket, one way. I guess he's going to pick up the other one over there. He'll buy them one way. He is a little tight. He's the only one who goes to McDonald's and orders day-old egg McMuffins. Uh, no, he went down to Laker Airways. You know, the uh, Freddie Laker who put in these uh, no-frills fright, he, the brown went down himself, plunked down $140 cash, and it is really a no-frills fight. For example, the passengers get together just before the flight and elect a pilot. <laughs> uh, uh, 
just... And... Now, I don't know if this is true, so Lakers shouldn't call. I understand if this plane would happen to go down in the ocean, in the water, um, they don't offer you a life preserver. What you do, you have to hang on to that little laminated card that points out the location of the emergency exit. <laughs> probably not true. <laughs> and, well, probably if the airlines, no. Brown is mad at the airlines because he lost his luggage. He had a perfectly matched set of cardboard boxes. <laughs> and he lost those. <laughs> he's the only man I know who goes to Europe with one traveler's check. But anyway, he's coming. Here's an item in the news. If you saw the Rams play in Cleveland this, uh, did you see that game in the snow? The Rams came from this weather, went back there, it was 20 degrees, and they what was the final score of that game? Nine to zero. Nine zip. They put him out. And Pat Hayden, the L.A. Rams quarterback, announced today, he's doing a great job. He's doing a good job. Announced today that he wore pantyhose. <laughs> yeah, he said the same kind that Joe Namath wore, or to keep, keep his legs warm. And when Anita Bryant heard the news, <laughs> she said, thank God I'm selling orange juice instead of Gatorade. Uh, Anita does not object to football players wearing pantyhose, but she would not allow school children to be tackled by them. <laughs> That's the one difference. Okay, tonight we have got a good show. We have Charles Nelson Riley. All three of those people are with us. The young man from Star Wars, uh, Mark Hamill, is with us tonight. Eugene Fodor and Dr. William A. Nolan, and we'll be with you with. Us Back. Oh, yes, back. <laughs> <laughs> like Star Wars around here. Got a great group here tonight. Yeah, that's a great audience. Great audience. <laughs> And now they're in shamelessly applaud themselves, yes. I might add. You know, sitting and watching, you know how many football games were on since Thanksgiving Day until last night on national television? A lot. Eleven or twelve games yeah. out here. You can just about get a little... I don't, after a while, I don't even know who's playing. Yeah. Just but that game check. playing in the snow Ooh. is wild, isn't it? Two or three inches of snow on the ground. And how in the hell do you catch a ball or pass yeah. when it's like that? But the Rams did well. You know, are you a big football Oh, very big. I saw most of the games. All right, I have here in my hands the official rules for professional football put out by the National Football League. This was in 1976. Pete Rosell, commissioner. Mm hmm I do get a little confused sometimes with all yes. of the signals. Uh, let's see how many of them you know. I'll give you the, uh, give you the signal. Right. You know this one, of course? Right, yes. Touchdown. What? Touchdown. Right. Now, don't look. I can't read it from here anyway. That's right. If I go like this, what does that mean? First down. First down. Very good. That's, uh... uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. 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 Loss of down. Loss of down. Loss of down. Time out. No, your deodorant isn't gone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take care of those later. Mind your own business. Uh, all right, you know this? Delay of the Delay game. Of game. Right. Yes, clipping. Personal foul. Oh, personal foul. Holding. Holding. Pass illegal, interference. Illegal use of hands, pass yeah. interference. Uh, let's see if I can find one here that I have. I will not remember. All right. Here's one I haven't seen. Okay. <laughs> what that is? <laughs> That's what the man has What is here. that? Pass juggle inbounds and caught out of bounds. Hmm. I've never seen that. Yeah, yeah. well, it's... What, you know what this is when they do put the hand? Illegal, forward, illegal, illegal forward, forward pass. Boy, this band Very is good. sharp. Uh, here's the one that somebody said before. It was this. That's the one. Yeah, An eligible receiver down, to, down the field. And what is this? And don't say he's going to fly. No. <laughs> Unsportsmanlike conduct. That's what... Wow. The, yeah. I didn't know all of no. these. Let's see. You know what this is? No, this is standing just like this. Now, do you know what this is? I don't. Anybody know? Get to the floor. No, crawling, pushing, or helping runner. I've never seen I've that one seen in a that? game. No. 
Well, there they are. Yeah. So NFL puts that, that book That's out? right. I should get that. You should. Because <laughs> I, I, I watch football all the time. It's my favorite sport. Hold on. Yeah. NFL puts it. Let me see the cover. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's silver. great. Silver. I'll try to get a copy of that. I wish you would. I've got quite a definitive library on football, I but I don't do. have that book. And uh -huh. I, there's a book, boy, that certainly says it all. I mean, if you want to know every single in the world, look in that book. Every single rule and signal is in that book. You are wrong, locker room breath. We have some more. Okay. There's more. Okay, we have some. I am calling Pete Roselle personally after the show <laughs> to tell him to suggest some that they are missing some signals they should have in there. Right. For example, it's not in there. What is that? Whose tooth is this? <laughs> You've never seen. Wasn't in the book. Wasn't in that book. <laughs> Didn't get it in there. Okay, this should be in there. <laughs> oh. What's that? Player relieving himself in the huddle. <laughs> shame, shame. Shame, shame. All right. What is it? Time out to remove dead man from field. <laughs> hasn't come up. <laughs> Excessive use of uppers, 10 yards. <laughs> what is it? No, no. Unlacing ball for immoral purposes. <laughs> I swallowed my whistle. You don't see that? You've seen this one. What is that? What's Dancing that? Dancing during the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> Ten yards. What's that? Illegal use of the majorette. <laughs> Woo! Not in it wasn't in the book. That's right. And... What's that? What? What's that? <laughs> Please tell Howard Cosell to shut up. That's what they need to have in the book. Yeah. Oh, was it in the book? <laughs> okay. We have uh, Charles Nelson Riley with us tonight, Mark Hamill, uh, Eugene Fodor, one of the great violinists in the world, and Dr. William M. Nolan, one of the fine doctors in the world. Who would like to be a violinist? Yeah. Here's one of the fine commercials. Here's in the one world. of the fine commercials. Yeah. After we do this fine commercial, we'll be back for this fine commercial. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. We have this Um, I should uh, point out that uh, we billboarded a guest to be on tonight's show that is not with us. Uh, very glamorous, exciting uh, country western singer, Dolly Parton. And uh, she came down with a flu, and she was very nice. She, she's a lovely girl. She called today and said she was very sorry that she had to cancel. And uh, she's going to be with us, I think, on December the 14th, if I recall. And we told her to get well. So quickly, we had to get somebody to fill in. And so we, we called in somebody we knew would probably be at home with nothing to do. <laughs> So would you please welcome the dependable, sincere, and really nice Charles Nelson Riley. Yes. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? It's nice Wonderful. to see you. And you nice were nice enough you. to bring Dolly's album well, out. Well, sure. She would have shown tonight. I didn't know which uh, pictures to use on the cover, so I used all three. Dolly Parton. Yeah, she, she's quite a, quite a young lady. Good singer. Good entertainer. She takes a chance. She takes a risk. That's why mm -hmm. she's good. She is an original. That's true. And so I like you. her very much. Well, I'll put it here with the other thing. All it's right. a good album. Here you come again, it's called. All right. And it's produced by Gary Klein. <laughs> and it's a uh, special thanks for the inspiration of Charles Copelman. Oh. <laughs> Whoever the hell he is. Yes, that's what it says in you the are, thing. Uh, you are dressed again to, uh, you dressed to the nines, as yes, they yes. said. It's the only thing I have. Where did that expression come from? Dressed to, dressed to the nines? Dressed to the nines. Do we find out where turkey came from? I was up all we night. We never found out where that expression. Ago. A bad show is a turkey and dressed I to the nines. I told that, the answer to that, many years ago. Well, we discussed it, but you were gone on the all other All right, night. because... On Thanksgiving That's night. what we discussed. Yeah, but no theater. further. That's, but nobody knew that. But before. no one knew it. I know it, and I told you, so now you know it. It's Kurt tonight, isn't he? 
Yes, no, he no. has. That's two out of two. He's doing films. Million. He's no. doing films on the no, outside. You know. Oh, I know. The more no. films you do, no, the no, crazier he gets. To be right that that audience was a tough audience because they were filled with turkey. Therefore, the play was a turkey. Well, we night. don't know. But that I didn't buy that. I heard you say that. Yeah. You did it lovely. Thank you. But I didn't buy that for some reason. How about dressed to the nines? I don't know either. This is just a little thing I got. You know. Yeah. Well, look, you came in as a last-minute replacement. That's all right. I, I think my career, I... No, I'm no. delighted you're here, and I didn't have time to really get any questions. The only call I, I got this week, what I'm I sorry. have the questions. I was going to ask Dolly Parton. So you're I just thought ask... I would ask them uh, You're going to ask why? I'd ask you the same questions I would ask Dolly Parton. All right, if it makes it easy for you. No, I know you're here only a few nights a week. I don't want to confuse <laughs> them. <laughs> you could. Ask me whatever Hostile you want. Forces are no, but this is, horizon. this is all. It's the weather and all the strange Santa Ana wind. That's what oh, I know. Here's a question I would ask Dolly Parton, because she always talks about it. She says she has a variety, something like 100 or 150 different wigs when she performs. Is that a problem uh, when you perform? <laughs> would you repeat the question? Is it... <laughs> Is a problem carrying all of those wigs. You have to have little wig boxes and then little uh, heads to put Well, them I on. don't have one wig box. See, and I don't wear a wig when I perform. But I wear a wig all the time. I mean, I, put, I get up in the morning, I put on the coffee first, and this goes on. You see? Right. So I don't have a lot of wigs. I have this one. $1,900, you don't buy 12. I don't want people to think that I'm cruel in referring to this because you have referred no, to it. No, I have referred to it the last time I was on. Yes, so this I is held on. Thing. It is artificial. I didn't want to. It is I held on. Cruel. No, you're not cruel. You're a lovely, a lovely host and a, and a legend in your own time. Thank you. <laughs> but um, it's true. But the thing is, the thing is, this is held on by three pieces of invisible tape. Right. And it's, uh, I just have one. I don't have, you know, one for this. And people, a lot of guys have long, short, crew really? cuts. Yeah, some guys but have. they need to make it look like they need a haircut, and then they go in and put on the shorter one? Oh, yeah. And then they have some with, they, they really do they dandruff and, 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 and all of that. They stuff. come with a little box of dandruff? They have everything. Then the other guys, one guy I, I has it, a friend of mine has it, it's got three, one, two, and three. He calls them one, two, and three. Good, and you, good. Well, for the, you know, like this is one, two, three is for the exercise class and, and the meditation and all that stuff. Right. So you don't, and, and for the beach. Right. And you change them. I haven't got time. I don't brush my teeth. I don't take care of myself. I got one thing. The three pieces of tape go on. It goes on. I say hello to the mailman. He doesn't know. And that's, I'm ready for the rest never, of the you've day. You've never picked up the mail sans hair? No, I don't. It's funny. It's very funny. I used to have it sewed into my head permanently. I didn't know. But it was a such a such a process, which was very comfortable. It was wonderful. And then you never took it off. Right. Five years I had it that way. Then one day I thought I was working out of town in a play, and the suchers were giving me trouble, so I said, back to tape. I'm going to go on tape. So what happened was, when you have it permanently on your head, you don't have a toupee. You see, you forget it. It's there permanently. That's right. But when you got it in the palm of your hand, yeah. And you're combing it, trying to keep it away from the dog. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly it dawns on you that possibly you have and must accept at this time in your life artificial hair. Oh. <laughs> now, see, Dolly looks great in it, and, you know, so we, that's okay. It becomes a costume for her. Yeah. yeah, and we also try to encourage people who are balding or losing hair to, uh, you know, if it looks real. Mm -hmm. It's very funny. A doctor, went, uh, the doctor that put it on my head said it will never come off, no matter what. Well, that's nice to know. So I made a pilot film once, and I didn't read the script carefully. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I was on the, on the, in the hotel, and I went down to the lobby to do the shots. It was with Karen Ballantyne in New York, and it was snowing. And so I'm in the lobby, and the man said, well, we can't do the scene we wanted to do at the, at the ice skating uh, arena, so we'll do all your helicopter shots. I said, why? Mm -hmm. I never read it. Mm -hmm. So I went on two helicopters all day, and the second helicopter was in Sheep's Meadow, and I'm standing in the snow, and I had a line that said, you never can get a helicopter when you want one. Oh, there's one. And it landed next to me, a big, big helicopter. You're basically big. Large, you're largey. And the doctor said that nothing will take this hair off. Except... Now, so as it comes down, Karen Valentine is doing the scene with me, blows away in the snow, and there's two shoes in the snow, and she's down the hill. <laughs> then I thought, possibly, this could be the day when the doctor was mistaken. <laughs> so I said, can we stop just for a moment, please? I have to discuss something with the director. So I discussed with the director the simple fact that maybe if I held the hair tight, right. it would look like I was concerned about my hairdo rather than... And it would be natural with a well, helicopter there. like this, I sort of would, you know, just casually yeah. holding it. <laughs> but the thing was, 
everything blew away, but the hair stayed on. And when you see the film, it never sold. <laughs> Nothing I ever did ever sold. You know what I mean? Have you made other pilot films for television? Every week I make a pilot film. Do you remember I the mean, names you... of any of them? I made one once. I forgot the name, but it was at Universal. It was about the ghost goes west, and I was the ghost. And I remember I had to climb a high chandelier and go in the chandelier with, and I had high heel shoes. It was a period piece. I, well, you know you. what I'm saying? And so I got up in the thing and they yelled, lunch! And I was left up in lunch for about 45 minutes. <laughs> but I do, de and then there was a period in television in the, all through the 60s and late, early 70s, yeah. where they thought, get Riley, he'll goose up the series. You know, as the neighbor next door. Right. You know what I mean? That the was boss, that period. Right. Yeah. And every time I got on one, it went off. And finally, after eight years, they said, he's not really goosing them too well. <laughs> off right away. Did you ever think of not wearing the hair sometime and just think of the different roles you could play? When they wanted an older or that kind, you could take, remove the hair. Why don't you save play, that question for Dolly Parton? play a character role. <laughs> you see? Well, I couldn't do that. My image. Right. If you open a door, something could happen. It could go right off. All right. <laughs> We're going to be back and continue this interview <laughs> in, in just a moment. <laughs> Our guests tonight are Mark Hamill, Julian Sporto, Dr. William A. Nolan, and Dolly Parton on my right. Uh, and you were very nice, Tom. I want to, want to thank well, you for... No, for coming in at the last minute. It's and, wonderful. And uh, jumping in here and, and helping us out tonight. My pleasure, any time. And uh, as I said, I had a couple of questions I was going to ask Dolly, so just pretend you're Dolly. I, I, if I remember... I forward a little. Yes, right. well, not, <laughs> not, not too far, or they'll get out the seismograph. Uh, I understand you were, uh, you were the fourth of 12 children from a poor Tennessee family, and you're a part uh, Dutch, Irish, and Cherokee Indian. Close. <laughs> I come from a family of one... Just me, well, it's and it's close. Swedish and Irish. You're Swedish and Irish? Yes. Oh, did you ever find your genealogy back? No. It's for some reason I don't care. I don't know why. A lot of people My don't. cousins do. They go to Sweden and they search and search. I don't know. Riley. I haven't had time. Riley I sounds more Irish. Riley, my father was Irish. My mother's birthday is today. She's 81 today. Is November. Right? Yes. Well, happy birthday. November 30th. Uh, happy birthday. That's very nice. She's a funny lady. What was her maiden name? Nelson, my middle name. No, that's Swedish, yeah. Yeah. You didn't ever live in Minnesota, did you? When I lived no. in Nebraska, Minnesota has a very large Connecticut. But Swedish we were very population. poor. Yeah. Were you poor? Very poor. How poor were you? Well, we were actually, we had no money at all. We had no heat. I didn't have heat till I was 30. <laughs> and that's true. Oh, come on. Now, see, you say, come on. Dolly Parton had all these the brothers. They went out, they got wood. They had, it was hot. No matter how poor they were, it was hot. Right. We did not have heat. We had a little stove in the kitchen that you put oil in. And I didn't get my first radiator till I was 30 years old. And I just looked at it, and I kept it on August, September, October. Sure, I never... It gets cold in Connecticut, too. Oh, it's freezing, yeah. So we, we, we never had very much. Well, never I'm did. sorry, I didn't know that. No, but now it's that better. It pays off, you know what I mean? Yeah, because you can't appreciate anything unless you have been without. No, no. Then I was, you see, I always cast my family. You should always cast. You know, you cast the family. Like, my mother would be Shirley Booth, my father, Frederick March. Right. My uncle would be uh, Ed Begley, and my aunt, Claire Trevor. And I'm Wally Cox as a child. Like that. Yeah. You, 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 you do it. Like, and the parts were too good. Like, my uncle would go out every night. We lived, seven of us, and my grandfather and my, and my grandmother in a two-and-a-half-room apartment in Hartford. Tell that to your Dolly Partons. They had everything, those people. They had acres over there. Really, and you didn't the share Two-and-a-half room and a lot of fish sticks. That's all we had was fish sticks. <laughs> so my uncle, first of all, they always thought I was odd. Really? You know what? I was odd. Because you wanted to be in show business, you mean? Well, I had different ideas. I had big ideas. Get away from those big notions. <laughs> so I took my humble place in the two and a half rooms with my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncle, my aunt, my mother, and my father. In two and a half rooms? Well, you took a number off the wall and you, had, you got a chance at the bed. It was wonderful. <laughs> and then what happened was they would stand in the doorway and I couldn't see as a child. Now, these are true. Tell these to your Dolly Parton's Couldn't brothers who either. had good eyesight from the fresh air. <laughs> all right? You were up in the woods. Going, I didn't Where's know. The first house? of all, people don't understand that when you're young, you don't know how you're supposed to see. You can't say, oh, I see badly because you think this is it. <laughs> you understand? You don't know. Somebody else tells you. Well, they can't tell you. You've got to see it. Then at the age of 17, 
when the damage is done and the pain is continuing, uh, I'll get through this. Did you ever go, <laughs> you go to the doctor? Well, did you yeah. ever occur to you that you might have had a radiator, but you couldn't see it? <laughs> I love you. I love you. No, we didn't. You we just didn't know where it was. Because you see, you developed a sense of, of heat. You would be more ah. susceptible to know there was something there. Of course. you. So then when you intuitively. finally, when you go to the teacher says, I think maybe the kid needs glasses. You know what I mean? That's really kind of bad. Well, it's true because you don't know. It's like hearing. And when you wake up, yes, you wake up and you can't see the bureau or the clock. You don't know what time it is. <laughs> and then you go to a doctor and he says, I'm going to try number five. And you go like this, you go... Holy! Wow! <laughs> Mommy! Wow, is this what it's supposed to be? But until that time... So I never was sports-like. You yeah. know what I mean? I never played sports because I couldn't see the ball. I barely could see the schoolyard. Well, didn't you know when you couldn't see the ball? Well, I figured... You see? No, I could see softball. I was good with softball. Yeah. I was terrific with softball, but that's kind of a <laughs> game. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I didn't do too good. So anyway, my uncle and everyone would stand in the door, my, my aunt, and they would say to me... Boy, that kid is odd. <laughs> my father would say to me, and I was sewing puppets, you know, close, like this. I was sewing puppets. There was nothing wrong with that. I mean, you were just close, close. You know somewhere. what I mean? So my father would say, his big line was, why don't you go out and throw a ball around? You know what I mean? And I would go. I could see the thread. <laughs> so anyway, this went on. I was strange. You understand yeah, what I mean? I think I'm getting the picture. <laughs> and then what and happened that was... That hurts, doesn't it? When you huh? hear people say the boy is odd, that hurts, right? Well, I you could tell you. So I have a book that I'm writing that's coming out that will tell... You know, it's a very... But I mean, I think all comedians go through a lot of uh, pain. And... Uh, it's my mother's birthday, so you think of all the funny things. It, yeah. it, was, it was difficult. But basically... It was, it, it was not too good. You yeah. know what I mean? But then you have dreams, you know. You, but it's true, I didn't have a, a radiator until I was 30. So anyway, two years ago, I'll get the end of this segment. Okay. We'll go out with a laugh. Don't hurry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they you... always would say I was odd. You know what I mean? first I used to play the accordion. Now, Eugene... No, that's Fedor, not odd. That's not odd. That's not odd. Did you ever see a kid say, Mommy... Could I have an accordion? <laughs> Check around this Christmas. No, usually it's four times. <laughs> you know what I mean? When did you say, I'll wait for the accordion, gift wrap it, please? Did you ever buy? Did anyone buy an accordion? <laughs> Wally and Wallace Welk. <laughs> no, but I mean, I had a, an accordion and I was thin. Did you want an accordion? No, the guy next door played it. And my mother said, give him an accordion. <laughs> so I had an accordion and it was heavy and I couldn't carry it and I couldn't stand up. So I had a sled, and I pulled this with no heat. I had a sled, and I pulled this accordion, and I played all this accordion. So anyway, to pulled make a the accordion lot. around on the sled? Yeah, and then I, was, I went with a girl, Ruth Senkel. Ruth Senkel. Who used to play the flute. Now, she would whip out the flute from her pocketbook, <laughs> do a couple of cadenzas, and the house would come down at every school function. By that time, I'm halfway up the hill with a hernia, and the accordion is on the floor. <laughs> And I play my thing and I get a mild applause. Now, wait a minute. A mild applause. Did you do Lady of Spain? No, my big one was Two Guitars by Monty and Americana. Oh, but right. anyway, to make a long story short... It's too late for to that. To tie now. it up now. <laughs> <laughs> to tie it up, two years ago, I have to bring an old story. I don't like to repeat no, myself. No, no. But two years ago, when we were gas rationed, right? Remember, we had to go... Sure, we sure. were either... Odd or oh, you're talking about clear back World War yes, II? Yes, no, just two years ago we had the race. Oh, odd or even the days we when odd, you could buy gas. Yeah. Odd or even, right? That's another thing. That's another thing. That's funny. So anyway, I went to the gas station. I got another one. I went to the gas station and the guy said to me, "Okay, are you odd or even?" <laughs> <laughs> and and I, oh no! I said, "You won't believe this, but I'm 44, <laughs> and until today, I was." Oh, <laughs> now I'm even filling up. But the other thing, wait. I forgot what I said. I forgot. It went away. That's a wonderful story. Oh, it's true. I did not know. I did not know till this moment you had such a traumatic childhood. We've no, all it, had our little... No, I don't remember my childhood. It went away. I mean, I can't say what the first little bunny rabbit Well, you remember like. that accordion you know, on the sled. You know, these people write books like Lillian Hellman and Mrs. Lindbergh about the, their second birthday. And Aunt Louise wore a blue dress with white pearls. <laughs> How the hell can you remember your second birthday? 
And they only come up for three years, and that's two books. <laughs> I'm 46, and I haven't got the frontispiece. You know what I mean? You're odd. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Oh, that's lovely. Back. I mentioned earlier. So as not to be one of the few people in the country walking around saying, I haven't seen Star Wars, I went to see it last night. I had I'd seen a couple of film clips. And it, it, it's quite a trip. It's really a, a fun film. And it is a... And underneath all the special effects, um, it, it's a story about a, a kid growing up on a planet that has, not like our two sons, monsters and strange people under any rock, but he seems to be pretty normal, and he plays the central character from Star Wars. Would you welcome Mark Hamill. Mark. First of all, I said, I never had so much fun in a motion picture since I was a kid and went to see Buck Rogers with Buster Crabbe. You see how quickly they forget, Buster? <laughs> oh, that was a big... They, they show those now on Channel 13 around, and those were done, I think, in the early 30s. And that was considered, you know, really far out. Right. They were way ahead of their time. But Star Wars is an That's, amazing film. It's exactly what inspired George to make it, really? though, because he has that great love for... He loved the Alex Raymond illustrations for Flash Gordon. He right. loved Buck Rogers. And he just felt that he wanted to make a movie where there were real heroes again. He thought, you know, with just cops busting people for dope and this and that, you know, he said, now let's go to a galaxy far, far away where we don't have to know why these guys are bad. They're just bad. Well, what it was, it was a Western. It's yeah. a, it's a intergalactic Western with the good guys very carefully delineated. Mm -hmm. You know where the bad guys are. You know the good guys. Yeah. You got the hero and his buddy who go to get the princess, right? Leia. Yeah. And, and it's all of those composite things together, and it's just for pure fun. You don't have That's to sit right. and say, what is the message behind this? No. What probing deep message. I understand well, was, some people, they told me some of the youngsters have been back five, six, and seven times to see it. We, we just visited the White House at that AFI film thing, and Amy yeah. Carter had seen it five times. We gave her a Stormtrooper helmet from the movie, oh, the, one of the, the uh, white, white ones? helmets, and I told her to wear it at the dinner table every night. <laughs> <laughs> so she doesn't have to see Billy. Yeah, that would be it. <clears throat> yeah, I just read the other day, it's going to be to sound mercenary, but you almost have to because it's a phenomenon in the business. And I'm sure when they made it, uh, from what I understand, they really didn't have any idea oh. because motion pictures are, are a gamble. You can spend a lot of money sure. until the public shows up. They either make it or break it. But I understand it's going to be, if not already, one of the biggest... It's already right. well, I, found, I, found, already? I asked today because you, so many people have asked well, how much money has it made, and people when you, in that you don't know. You, you just say... It's the largest grossing. It, it went over Jaws a few days ago. Yeah, what was the final total? It, 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 you know, it's made 109, 191 million in the United States in less than six months. 191 million dollars. Uh, you know, who, it's, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> and it hasn't even been released overseas yet, right? Uh, it's in just opening now in Paris and Australia and a couple other places. But that is incredible. It is. We when we were making it, I uh, people asked me, "Well, did you think it was going to be successful?" And uh, yeah, I, I thought, it, I never really thought about it. I just right. thought, gee, this is great fun. I mean, they're giving us laser guns, and I get to rescue a princess, and, you know. Uh, it looks like a campy uh, thing to make. Well, sure, and it was so hard. A lot of times, it's a true story. Harrison Ford, who plays the space pirate in the film, at one point threatened to tie George up and, and uh, make him say his own lines at gunpoint. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the dialogue was a little bit difficult. I remember there was one line that I just begged him to take out of the screenplay, and he finally did. And you it's when, the line? yes, boy, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I sometimes dream about this line. Uh, it was just coming upon the exploded planet of the princess, right. Alderaan, and it's Alderaan. All totally been blown away. And Harrison says, look, kid, I've uh, done my part of the bargain. When I get to an asteroid, you, the old man, and the droids get dropped off. And my line was, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquilae or Soas. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, who talks like this, George? <laughs> I mean, this is really not fair because, you know, we're the ones that are going to get vegetables thrown at us, <laughs> not you. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> now, you got to remember, you are luckier than a lot of people in the film. At least people know you. Oh, I saw yes. an item in Newsweek today. Just came out. 
about the fellow who played Darth Vader, who's an English actor. That's right, and David I, Prowse. David, what's his name? Prowse. He's a British weightlifting champion. And he says, here I am in the, one of the biggest grossing motion pictures of all times, and he plays, you know, Darth Vader, the guy in the black thing. Nobody knows who he is. Yeah. And the... And the and the, the little R2-D2. R2 well, R2-D2, there were about nine different R2-D2s, and eight of them were real robots, either hydraulic air or radio-controlled or little wires. And one had Kenny Baker, who's the smallest man in England. It was really terrible, because there'd be like five R2-D2s all around the set, and we'd go to lunch, and we'd hear a little man going, let me out, let me out. <laughs> he, we would be like making, placing bets on which R2-D2 which one of... you thought he was in. You know, See, at least they you know you by your face. <laughs> How about the fellow who played the droid now? Uh, uh, in the gold. Oh, that's right, Anthony Daniels. Nobody knows who he is. And he was terrific. One of the major in actors in the whole thing. Yeah. 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 We have a uh, couple of minutes. I'm going to show you a couple of minutes like it needs a plug or something. Um, but those of you who haven't seen it might uh, get a kick out of this. Well, what particular scene is this, Mark? You know, we're going to Oh, uh, yeah, this is, uh, we've just rescued the princess. Uh, princess Leia, right? Princess Leia, and... Uh, Actually, we've, it doesn't make any difference. If now, you just you, put it on, just we'll watch all it have a good laugh. It's too bad we don't have, we, too bad we don't have the whole stereophonic sound here. You know, <laughs> blast this out. Which way? All right, men, load your weapons. Stop that ship! Blast them! I've forgotten how much I hate space travel. You Many know. people have compared it to Ibsen, actually. Oh, yes, close. Fred, 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 Fred Ibsen, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. No, so many people ask me about uh, Sir Alec Guinness. I guess the two most often questions are Sir Alec and the robots. And there's a wonderful story that kind of tells you about both of them. There was many, many dwarves in the film and midgets to play little Jawas, little creatures. Right. And there was one who, in real life, was not an actor. He's a comedian. He's a stand-up comic in Music Hall, which is like vaudeville over there. Right. And he's a spritz comic. He's an insult comedian. He's like a waist-high Don Rickles. And ah, seriously, he was always... He would just insult you. You could never deal with the guy because you couldn't get a joke in. He was just too funny. And, he, and it, an example, one of his running gags was he th felt that it was uh, an insult that he didn't get a chair with his name on it. And all the actors in the film did. So he found this rock in the Sahara Desert, this big flat rock. And he took a piece of adhesive tape and put his name in indelible ink. And he carried this rock <laughs> every location we went on in Africa before the truck could even unload our chairs. Well, we were still, he would already be there with an umbrella, a little lemonade, some sunglasses, <laughs> and sun oil. Say, oh, did your truck bro break down or what? So uh, we Guinness were, is wonderful. That well, that's it. We went yeah. one night to dinner with, with Sir Alec, and he's very reserved, kind of shy at first, but he has a sense of humor that really comes out, and he helped me get this guy because Tony Daniels, who played 3 Pio, said, tell Sir Alec what he told you. And I said, oh, yeah. Uh, Jack, who normally is always on, finally got serious one time, and he said, you know, I do joke a lot, but the truth of the matter is I am so in awe 
of Sir Alec Guinness. And I don't know what to say, because when I was a kid in London, I would go all over town on the bus to try and see one of his films. And I said, well, gee, didn't you meet him when we got on the charter airplane? And very seriously, he said, oh, yeah, he's a tremendous guy. When I got on the plane, he spoke to me straight away. He said, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you little, I'm going to get you. And we told Guinness this. Now, Guinness chuckled, and he sort of stroked his beard. And we were in a big dining hall, and, and Jack, this little dwarf, was over holding court, big laughs at the dinner table. And Guinness leaned over to me and said, which small person is he? And I said, see that guy over my right shoulder? Now, fade out. Two weeks later, we're in the desert again. We're, or it's, it's complete open wilderness. You, everywhere you can look, you can walk with your eyes closed and never fall down. And Jack is sitting on his rock reading his book. And Guinness started very slowly walking towards Jack. And I said, this is it. This is the day. And I kind of watched from the side. Guinness had the hood on, like that big sorcerer's hood. And he's really ominous looking. And he kept getting closer to Jack and closer to Jack. And Jack started, like, looking around and thinking, well, I'd better say something. So he was halfway off his rock to say hello. And Guinness pulled the hood back and said, get out of my way! Get out! And Jack, the blood dropped from his face. And he was shaking. He just looked all around because you could go anywhere and not bump into him. <laughs> well, that... He, Jack, Jack said to me, I have to hand it to you, when you play a practical joke, you get the best talented people in England. That's fine. You can do the sequel too, I understand, right? Yeah. Star Wars. Okay. We'll return after this message from Sears, the men's store. Okay. Moving along. My next guest... regret is that Charles did not bring his accordion so you could have duetted together. <laughs> we'll be back after this message from Teledyne. One step. We're back. We're talking to Gene Fodor. And Dr. William Nolan will join us shortly. That, that was really beautiful. Well, I was listening you. to you practice. I was in makeup and I heard well, you in your dressing room. Before we go on, yeah. could, I, could I tell you... Uh, could I ask you if you know how much you're doing for classical music? Because I know we, we get off onto uh, various topics. But I, yeah. I, want, I want you to know that uh, when I go out to play a performance, you know, I, I get all psyched up and I go out there and I, and I play and all you know, this difficult stuff for two hours, you know, and I go back to my dressing room and uh, open the door and there's a line of people around through the hall and, and around the corner. And, and what do they come back to talk about? My concert that I've spent... 20 years of my life practicing for it? No, they, they come and say, uh, we saw you on Johnny Carson. And, and that's why we're here. Now, a lot of those people normally would not have gone to the concert. Uh, and uh, some of them even think that it's, it's not so painful. They might even enjoy it. So they go back another time, and then that's uh, a new fan of classical music. So that's I want great. to thank it's, you. And it's nice behalf. to hear. You know, and other artists uh, from uh, the Metropolitan and other classical arts have said that. And it's been an education for us and a joy on the show to be able to present artists like you and, and other people from time to time because unless you're exposed to it you know what good does it do it's tough to play on the show really I, well th this is the television oh, show come on. well let's face it a, a concert i mean what <laughs> well, your concert you're in your element you mean, yeah what you know, you, i know what you're saying you're saying because, a concert and you're in your element yeah, but it's that's... not because it's an unnatural kind of thing i mean doc is one of the great musicians of, of this country and right. and uh you know being around him and yes so i feel like i'm in, in a musical atmosphere but, it, you know, what auditorium holds 15 million people? And this yeah. is the kind of market that... Lying in bed. You know, I wanted... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you have <laughs> taken lessons all your life, starting as a child. And it has to be expensive, because you don't... You just don't go take from uh, Harry and Al, his violin shop. I mean, <laughs> you, I mean you've got to take from a, a master, su right? You'd be surprised how many, how many people do. I, you know... 
I'm often asked the question, uh, how do you find a good teacher? Right. Well, it's, it's a very difficult one indeed because um, there are so many um, home-brewed approaches to the violin, right. whereas uh, they, they miss the entire aspect of, of playing any instrument, whether it's the right. voice or the guitar or uh, <coughs> the piano. The, the most natural uh, approach is also the one that works best. I mean, when you hold the violin and the bow, it looks terribly awkward. But yeah. really, if you if you're completely relaxed, this is the ideal way to hold the bow. Just flip your hand, place the bow there, and and you have it. A lot yeah. of people go through all sorts of contortions. It's the same thing with the left hand. The fingers right. should fall on the string naturally, not leaning toward the nail or, or right. other things. That you'd be surprised because of the difficulties of the instrument. You mentioned they, something interesting last time you here that the the, the violin the, the hairs in the violin. If I remember, you say the good ones are, only are, come from a certain Russian type. Well, uh, no. A certain kind of horse? You didn't listen very good. Well, I, you know. No, it, it comes from the tail of white horses. The tail of white horses. Well, that's close, isn't well, it? Well, preferably from a colder climate. Now, as uh, we know, Russia Russians. has... See, I had a I was in the general area. In yeah. other words, a cold horse is what we're reading. With a warm tail. With a warm tail. <laughs> Happiness is a warm tail. Uh, no, words, that's because... Uh, we better clean this up a little. Let's do that. The, there are more barbs. When I was in the general area, wasn't I? <laughs> there are more barbs on uh, a tail from a colder climate because of course there are. It, it, it creates greater insulation, right? Right. I mean, don't you have more barbs on your blanket in the winter than. No, I guess not. It's an idea. We'll be right back after this, so stay with us. <laughs> Dr. Uh... Dr. William Nolan is with us. He's been with us several times before. He's an eminent surgeon and the author of several books about, well, naturally, medicine and surgery. What do you think he'd write about? And <laughs> he also writes... <laughs> well, a man's a doctor. He's not going to write about trees. He writes a regular medical column from a Calls magazine, and we we'll certainly need him here tonight. Would you, doc would you doctor, would you welcome Dr. William Nolan? Or Dr. William Nolan. Hello, Doc. How are you tonight? Fine, thanks, Johnny. How are you? Good. Good. What do you want to talk about tonight? Last time we talked about a number of things, about how to choose a doctor, doctor's advertising, right, yeah. and so forth. Have they gotten any closer to that? Of doctors, the MA uh, still a little reluctant to let doctors uh, advertise? Yeah, they're, they're still reluctant, but if you look in the L.A. Times paper, you find that they are advertising. I mean, cosmetic surgeons particularly. Uh, one of the things we're, gonna, we're thinking of talking about a little bit was this whole problem of... Uh, you know, unnecessary surgery and elective surgery, and, and what the what the difference is. You know, what uh, is elective surgery? Well, Something you don't really need at the time, but you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a bad term. You know, people have gotten the idea that we're running around unnecessarily operating on people. The the fact is that let's say I, I did probably, I would say, ten operations in the last couple of weeks, and uh, uh, six or seven of them would probably be classified as not necessary in the strict sense, but appropriate. And I like think that's what? the right word. Well, uh, four gallbladders, a couple of hernia repairs. Now, uh, one, <laughs> one cancer of the bowel, and uh, one, one cancer of the bowel. But that and, was needed, was Yeah, it? right. A cancer of the bowel, ruptured spleen, those are needed right away. But the others, you know, you could l let them wait to see Why what kind of trouble they have. But they, 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 they have symptoms. They want to get rid of these symptoms. And so it's appropriate to remove the gallbladder to do this kind of... Uh, the same thing applies in medicine. You know, there are... Uh, Oh, I, uh, this uh, surgeon from out east was telling me Suppose about... Suppose I came into you and said, I want you to take my appendix out, which I've never no, done. No, I, I Would wouldn't you say do don't do it? Well, no, no, I wouldn't do it. I mean, if you came in, you have the signs of a acute appendix. But don't uh, do it just to have it out. Well, no, no. I, now, if I were in operating on you for another reason, the, for, for example, if I were to take your golf barrel, let's say you're having golf... You, you take the appendix off an encore or something? Well, uh, I, would, I would ask the patient, would you like me to remove your appendix while I'm in there? And if you would, I will do it. Well, I mean... As long it, as the store is open, you might as well. Do. Yeah. I mean, you've got the abdomen open. They've had the anesthetic. Uh, not, a uh, lot of patients will say, while you're there, will you take out my appendix? And it, I always tell them, if it's easy, I'll do it. If it's hard to get at it, then I won't do it. Uh, with hysterectomies, the same thing applies. You know, you remove the uterus. If the, you know, the appendix is sitting right there, and if everything's gone well up to that point, right. they would like to have it removed just so they don't have to worry about it. But there are, there are a lot of things. Uh, 
uh, in medicine that are a matter of judgment. Uh, um, well, a surgeon friend of mine from back east was telling me about a cardiologist, about a doctor friend of his, went into the, uh, had a bad corner in his late 60s, he's in, in, his, in the intensive care unit, and uh, he's, his heart stopped 13 times. I mean, he had to be restarted 13 times, you know, apply the electric shock and all that stuff. Now, it's a question of judgment. Should you do this or shouldn't you do this? Do what? Well, restart it. Uh, yeah. Well, honestly, I mean, you get somebody that's, that's this old uh, or that's not too well and has a very, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the chances of making it through aren't great. Uh, it's a matter of, of judgment. How far should you go? And uh, afterwards, they were through, you know, all this business that you've been reading in the, um, you know, about life after life where people who have been close to death have had or visions so they died. of themselves. Yeah, they, they supposedly have died and they've pictured themselves. Uh, uh, I think course, as most doctors do, that this is strictly a matter of uh, lack of oxygen going to the brain. I mean, they didn't die. Yeah, hallucinate. No, you're not really dead. But with this, this man, they asked him afterwards if he had any visions in the times that his heart had been stopped of what uh, the afterlife might have been like. And they, he said, no. And they said, well, what did you think about it? He said, well, the only two things that concerned me were, first of all, I was afraid there might be an intern on duty who wouldn't know what to do, you know, would know which drugs to give or whether to apply the shocks. And uh, the second thing I worried about was that the man in charge of the coronary carrier unit might have been one of these damn fools that believes in the right to die. <laughs> I mean, he didn't want anybody taking care of him who felt that, uh, well, you know, we've that's started him up 12 times, that's it, you know. That's uh, where that ethical not question comes in. Right, again, it's an ethical question. Uh, well, we're faced with it a lot. I mean, I, I have patients with cancer. If I'm cancer. ever in, would you restart mine? Just yes, I, and of course, I, I want, want, I want right mine now. restarted, uh, you know, at every opportunity. Uh, but most surgery is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of choice. I, I had my heart operated, as right. I've talked about several times here. Now, I'll, you know, a couple of my partners didn't think I should have that done. They thought I should go with the medical treatment. I could have done that. I'd probably still be around, but I would have had to change my lifestyle, right. which I didn't want to do. I still wanted to play racquetball. I wanted to write. I wanted right. to practice surgery. I wanted to do all these things. So you had the bypass. So I had the bypass done, and I'm able to do all Did this. Did they take out your appendix while they were in there? <laughs> they were in the wrong cavity. Oh. Thank heavens. Yeah. No, they, uh, they left that behind. I've still got it. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, the point I'm making is that when we are accused of doing unnecessary surgery, it's a question not really of unnecessary surgery. It's a question of inappropriate surgery right. sometimes. And
Chào tất cả mọi người Và hôm nay bên em lại về một chiếc Matip SE Số sàn sản xuất 2005 Chiếc xe nói chung là nếu mà người ta thường chiêu nhau xe đời tống đó Tuy nhiên là xe này mà ví dụ là để trên mưa trên nắng Đón con đi học và mọi thứ thì rất là ok Giá nó chỉ bằng rẻ bằng cái xe máy thôi Thế tôi thật Rất là rẻ Mấy chục triệu thôi Xe biển Hà Nội 2662 cũng khá là đẹp ngày xưa nếu mà cái thời hay không nể mấy mà con này chắc là cũng phải gọi là gọi là người cũng gọi là lắm tiền rồi tổng thể chiếc xe chiếc xe màu này nhìn rất là ổn nhìn nó đã biết là xe của dành cho những người gọi là như chúng mình chúng ta rồi người không có tiền tuy nhiên được cái rất là nhỏ gọn vì vậy nếu đi trong nội thành hoặc là đi đường nhỏ gọn đường nhỏ hẹp rất là ok lốp còn rất là đẹp cả hai cả bốn bánh luôn đây chúng tổng thể thì 2005 nó cũng chỉ được thế này thôi cũng mình không quá khen nó đẹp biết làm chi vì là nó xấu rồi đó nhưng mà tít thì nó cũng gọi là dòng những dòng mà mình dùng mình đi tạo mình mới nó có, có bằng mình tập lái là rất là ok còn nếu mà để nói là đi sướng lắm thì thì không vì uh, bây giờ những dòng xe đời mới bây giờ thì mới bốn năm trăm thì rất là sướng hơn nhiều tuy nhiên là dòng này nó giá trị chưa bằng một phần mười nó phải khác biệt tuy nhiên là xe này keo chỉ vẫn còn ngon mỗi tội là xe bị bị va quẹt sức sơn rất là nhiều tuy nhiên là keo chỉ mọi chi tiết ngày máy móc vẫn còn ngon keo chỉ nguyên zin mỗi tội là nó sức sơn nhiều móc miết thỉnh thoảng móc miết một vài chỗ tại vì hai không đến bây giờ thì làm sao mà nó còn quá ngon được các bạn nhưng tổng thể chiếc xe đây xe gầm nghiêng vẫn còn rất là chất không không phải là quá là quảng cáo gì nhiều nhưng mà xe rất là chất Đấy, chúng các keo chỉ bốn cánh rất là nguyên di còn các những chỗ khác thì sức sơn rất là nhiều đã giảm sơn lại rất nhiều nói thẳng thế cho nhanh khen đẹp suốt ngày khen đẹp nhưng mà mà nó lại quá lát thì, thì khen đẹp làm gì nội thất bên trong thì nó xuống cấp rồi quá nhiều rồi vì là hai nghìn năm mười mấy mười năm mười sáu năm rồi rồi nội thất bên trong thì nó còn bẩn nữa cơ nó đã xấu rồi nó còn bẩn được cái trần thì còn mới trần còn được vì trần là tất cả dòng xe đều mới cả vì không ai sờ đến trần bao giờ còn đây keo chỉ cũng vẫn là nguyên bản nguyên zin cả các bạn ạ xe được cái cổ cổ nhưng mà được cái keo chỉ vẫn còn nguyên cũng chả giải quyết gì mấy hai ghế vô lăng đấy xuống cấp từ thời gian cần số thì cũng may là cần số nhìn vẫn rõ không mù mờ quá cho các bạn xem về máy móc thì máy móc thế này là còn được mười mấy năm thì còn như này ngày xưa cũng gọi là thiết kế mọi thứ nó thô sơ nó máy móc nó thiết bị nó chưa hiện đại mà được như này còn được rồi nhìn rất là đơn giản nhưng như không cũng không phải soi quá nhiều và chiếc xe này thì người ta đang giả 35 triệu thì rất nhiều người giả nhưng không bán và phải được giá 38 triệu thì mới bán hồ sơ xe này ở Hà Nội có nghĩa là xe ở Hà Nội và đã rút hồ sơ gốc rồi nhá ai mua thì nếu mà mua ở Hà Nội thì có thể là chỉ gần sang tên thôi còn đâu thì không thì em đã rút hồ sơ về đây rồi giá bán là 38 triệu bao rút hồ sơ 38 triệu các bạn chỉ mua con xe quay nữa là 20 triệu rồi 38 triệu mà đã có một con xe đi rồi thì cũng quá là ok có gì bằng 38 triệu cho đừng mặc cả các bạn người ta giả 35 triệu không bán rồi đây trong chiếc xe còn rất là ok ai mua liên hệ sớm với em có số điện thoại để trên góc trái màn hình bởi vì là ba mấy triệu mà cả gì nữa
thường người ta sẽ bán tầm 40 41 triệu giá chuẩn của nó là như vậy nhưng mà xe này nó sức sơn với nó móc méo nhiều nên bán 38 triệu đi đường thì mọi người cứ đến check và đi thử cũng được vì là xe này thì nó cũng giá cả nó mấy chục triệu thôi thì cũng không không nói nhiều lời thế xin chào tất cả mọi người